Today's reading comes from Mark 12, 38 through 44, on page 881 on your hymn Bible. And while Jesus was teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long robes and have salutations in marketplaces and the best seats in synagogues, and the places of honors and feasts, and who devour widows' houses, and who for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury, and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people were putting in large sums of money. And a poor widow came, and put in two copper coins, that make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, her whole living. The word of God. And 
so the pashmina scarf lady, come on, come on. The guy who sells African <clears throat> baskets, I love collecting my pashmina scarf in my African basket. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's where I see Jesus and his friends, God forbid all of them, waiting for their wives who are shopping <laughs> at a bistro table with their non-fat, no foam, caramel macchiato, right? I don't know. And so there are people watching, and Jesus notes that some like to wear the best robes and be greeted with respect and have the best seats or the place of honor. And as he people watched, I imagine he saw many people who fit that description. And so what I'm saying is that Jesus sat with his friends judging, <coughs> judging people as they walked by. It seems so. A little bit. So look at that one with me, with the perfectly dressed suit, all ready for the temple. Or how about that one? She always talks about herself. Or look at that one. I'm so uncomfortable thinking of Jesus doing this right now. <coughs> the reason is I'm the only one in the room wearing a robe. And I like good seats. <laughs> and I like for people to notice me. He might have been talking about me had I been at the temple that day. Had he seen me paying for my exotic pashmina scarf and placing it in my African basket while I also picked, you know, beets and greens and things. People, he's looking at people, all going to the temple for what was supposed to be about God. And that's when Jesus points out the widow. Look at her. No one noticed her over there. She's going about her day and she's giving all that she had. She didn't spend it on a new scarf or even food for herself. Instead, she's giving it to God. And it's a tiny little offering. Tiny. Just a few coins. <coughs> the offering looks like her, right? It's feeble and it's vulnerable. There's not much left. The offering represented her. And now I go back to that commentator and I read what he was saying differently. Does God intend for me to give of myself and my stuff until there is nothing left? Yeah. I'm going to give every day of my life until I'm a feeble wid widow when there's not much left to give and I'm still going to give. Yes, that's what God asks. But you can't squeeze blood from a turnip, right? That's the saying, and basically means that things can only produce what's <coughs> true of what they are. You can't get blood from a turnip. A person or an institution or an organization can't give what it doesn't actually have, or what it actually isn't. You can't get blood from a turnip. The blood turnip is one of the oldest surviving varieties of, wait for it, the beet. <laughs> Beets come from America. They are like blueberry pie and baseball. Blueberry pie, baseball, and beets. <laughs> I love beets. Who loves beets? Okay, who doesn't love beets? I should be honest. Shame on you. You don't like beets? I am shocked. Can you believe I just pointed my finger at someone in church? I thought for sure you like beets. That's really funny. All right, they're not everyone's piece of pie, right? But. My favorite way, well, I'll ask you, how, how do you like your beets, for those of you who like beets? How do you like to eat beets? Just straight or borscht. Borscht. Let's just all say that word because it's fun to say. <laughs> <laughs> how do you like your beets? Pickled beets. Pickled beets. <laughs> who else? How do you like your beets? I don't know my mom does to eat cooked and I put a lot of butter on them, and I like beet greens. Mm. Cook them with butter because butter makes everything better. <laughs> or the greens. Absolutely. Come on. Who also eats the greens? Beet greens. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Beet greens. How else do you like your beets? Salad. Yeah. Salad. Salad. Boiled vinegar, little parsley, garlic. Boiled vinegar, little parsley, garlic. Pineapple. 
think I've ever had. Okay, anyone else? No one's named my favorite kind of way to prepare the beet. Huh? I, I don't think so. Do you? Do? Would that be the same kind of person that eats raw potatoes, though? Because my son does that. It's sick. When I'm preparing, sometimes he comes over me and takes a piece of stew. Right, so I don't know. I guess people can eat them raw. My favorite way to eat the beet is roasted with olive oil, salt, and pepper. Oh my lord, y'all gotta do that. Seriously, today, you have to make beets roasted. It's beet season, for goodness sake. Okay, so beets, why, why am I talking about this? <laughs> we are so glad it says it here, right? No matter how you prepare a beet, it is a beet. Right? I mean, I, I, that, it should go without saying, right? But beets produce beets. And Jesus is trying to make a similar point that day. That when he sat outside the treasury with some of his friends, he didn't focus actually on the woman. He focused on her offering. He focused on her sacrifice. We don't even call it that anymore. We call it an offering. And here's the horrible truth, is that we at Community Presbyterian Church don't even call it offering. We call it our gifts of thanksgiving. We've We've flown, swung so far away from the idea of sacrifice. Jesus was trying to talk about how far the temple had moved away from what sacrifices were supposed to be. We started this season, like I said, a long time ago. And like I said, the week that we collected our pledges, we had this big storm and no one got the pledge cards in the mail. And so here, again, we enter another week. We're going to collect our pledge cards, but we've broadened it out. So in the back of pledge cards, in case you didn't get one, there also was an I can do that list, which was something that we've been toying around with, little things that the session often says, you know, I bet people would do this. We just need to tell them people need to do it. <clears throat> and so here is how I actually entered my week, knowing I did not get my pledge card ahead of time, right? Not that I didn't know it was coming. Right? But maybe some people did, right? So I enter my week and I'm wondering about my offering and my pledges and I found myself questioning my own meaning of sacrifice. I don't know how you work out money that you give away. Or how you work out the time you give away. Or how you work out your talents that you give away. I don't know how you do that. As your pastor, I want to say, do that. Figure it out. Not, I'm not even saying give away your money or your time or your talents. I am saying you should spend time figuring out how you do that. What's too much? What's not little? If you are in a relationship with someone, if, you have a, if, you are, if, you, if your life is not your own, you should really do that with someone else, too. What does this mean? How about to the people you work with? What does it mean to give away your talents or your time? You should think through that. We should be thinking, reflective people. And so I was taught that offering, any offering in church, should ouch a little bit. I went back to kind of what I, what I have gathered over the years that has stuck. If it doesn't cost me anything, then it's just a gift. And gifts are great, but they're not usually a sacrifice. And maybe that's hard for us to imagine, really, even having gone through the storm. And some people are here who, who, who had damage in their world from the storm. But we didn't go without food or water. And we were surrounded by people who love us, who were really trying to find us and make sure we had food and water. So it's hard for us to imagine a life where <coughs> sacrifice, cost, gift, offering, how does that ouch? <clears throat> And I'm not going to make the case that you can squeeze blood out of a turnip, because you can't. What I want to make the case for is that we're supposed to squeeze. And when you squeeze me, out comes me. And I, Pete and I sat down and wanted to wonder if what we give away, our money to church and to other organizations, and our time and our talents, does it squeeze? Am I sacrificing anything? 
My sacrifice is supposed to squeeze a little. And the stewardship folks, I think over the past few years, have begun to give a lot more information, and they've included you a lot more too in the conversation. There's a lot of information. I made copies in case you wanted to look again at the um, email that went out kind of after the storm before last Sunday, because it gives some information on how we pay our bills and how even the sacrifices break down in our community of faith. And so all I can tell you is my own story, and this is the first time I've done that. I was challenged by some colleagues in our presbytery that we ought to talk about our, how we give as pastors, right? And there's definitely an old school thought that says you don't do this, right? I guess. I don't know. It's my first time doing it. So I'll tell you that Pete and I looked at the chart on that email, and we judged ourselves by it. How do I measure up? Do I feel comfortable with that or not? And then we took out our budget. And the truth is that we do this part every year, right around stewardship time. We, we figure out our budget. We look at it together. Pete pays all of our bills. Thank God, because he's so much better at it than me. And I just like to buy cash me this clothes. <laughs>
an enormous amount of conversation that you ever thought you would have to have about how much you give for church. If you hear anything, if you haven't thought about it, don't put your pledge card in yet. If you haven't talked to your partner or your family about it, don't put your pledge card in yet. Please think about it. Think about how you give your time and your talents and your money. Think about it. And I'm not saying you got to give 6% either. That's what the Sabinskis are paying. I am saying percentage is better than amount. At least for our church. Not better. We think in percentages. The Community Presbyterian Church does. We think in percentages. So look at your, look at your income and think percentage as opposed to amount. I, I think that... To me, that, that's, more, that's more telling of my personality. That's more telling of me, like the widow. Her offering was telling of her, right? Mm -hmm. If it didn't say she gave all she had and she gave two cents, we'd go, it's a great passage. I, I have two cents right here, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what it said. It said she gave, she gave two coins and that it was this proportion of her life. So think proportionately. So I think that one of the things that's great about our church is that we really want each of us to give what is true of ourselves with no judgments. And so if you're uncomfortable, start paying attention again because i got one more thing to say. That over my time here, I have spent a lot of time with people who have had major transitions in their life. They've lost jobs. They've chosen intentionally different jobs. They've, they've chosen on purpose not to make the same amount of money that they've always made. I've been with people who have gotten better jobs. What I love about that is that every one of those conversations I got to actually have with them. What, what do you want your life to be, right? You guys were part of the conversation with the Sabinskis when Pete went from a working person to now working for the federal government on disability, right? People have different life changes that happen. People retire. People grow up and get a job. Like Things happen differently in our life. And when we function as a community, then we're letting people be that. Whatever you are, wherever you are in your phase of life. If you make this much, if you make this much, if you have this much talent, or if you have this much talent, right? If you have this much time, or seriously, I hardly sleep, have time, right? That we're in this together. And so proportionately, we should be giving something that's true of who we are. What I hear Jesus saying, though, is that not every sacrifice is equal. And that's a really hard thing to hear. Not every gift is a sacrifice. And our giving needs to represent who we are and what we have and how we trust. That was true of that widow. <clears throat> Might it be true of us? Amen. Amen.